Please be seated. Thank you for your song today. Grace and peace to each one of you this day in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the, the things we, I think, take for granted and sometimes um, need to step back from for just a second to really, truly appreciate it is the fact that it seems like part of God's design is for us to live in community. To live in community and have communion with God, to live in community with one another. And, and today I want to think about that. And to think about what's best about um, being together in Christian community. Okay. So the lesson today is from Paul's writing to the people of Colossus. It's the first chapter. And in it here we have Paul who is an evangelist, a church planter, a pastor, um, a bishop if you were. Um, knew this people these people of Colossus from a distance. But he knew how valuable their beginning community was as they are living out following Jesus in this, in a new way, I mean, in a brand new thing in this world. Not always met with um, acceptance, challenging. And this new community is breaking through all sorts of things. Men and women are relating to each other in a different new way. People of um, different economic strata are now calling each other brother and sister. Even different ethnicities or nationalities, Romans and Greeks and Jews, finding new ways to be community together in a way the world had never seen. And Paul writes these words of encouragement to them as the introduction to um, a much longer letter. The first chapter of Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at, um, at Colossa. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of the love you have for all the people, the faith and love that springs from the hope that is stored up for you, and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has borne fruit and grown among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all of its truth. The lesson for this day. There's an old hymn that I wanted to just share the text of. It's kind of our secondary text today. It's one you might know. I'm not even sure if it's in our most contemporary hymnal. But it goes like this. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. Bind us together in love. Okay, some of you know this one. There is only one God. There is only one king. There is only one body. That is why we sing. Fit for the glory of God, purchased by his precious blood, born with the right to be free, Jesus the victory has won. We are the family of God. We are the promise divine. We are God's chosen desire. We are the glorious new wine. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. Bind us together in love. Okay. It seems to be part of God's design for us to come together in the name of Jesus and be literally one body, one corpus, one corporation, one body, visible, active in mission in this world. Now, the obvious quick word to say here is that when we get it wrong, and think that coming together means we put up a, a barrier to the world when we begin to lack humility and believe that we are better than the world or that it is us against them or that this is a closed society, a closed communion, well, then we're off the tracks. But as long as we remember that we're gathered together to join Jesus into mission in this world, out into the world that Jesus loves, and that God so loved, loved so much that he gave Jesus. 
as long as we remember that our hearts and minds need to be open to neighbor the stranger, then we can claim to be the living, visible, body, corpus of Jesus. Now, I'm coming up to my 25th anniversary of ordination. And if you would ask me when I was a 16-year-old guy if I was going to be a pastor, I would have thought you were nuts. Okay? I loved my church, and I had a great youth group growing up, and I was pretty much in one congregation all of my growing up, and they had loved me really well, but there was nothing on my radar about doing this for my life. And once in a while, I'm just stunned that it's come to this. Okay? And um, you now perhaps God is too. We'll see about that. But when I, was a, when I was a young guy and going to college at Gustavus, I thought I'd be a lawyer. I was a debate geek in high school. I loved legal things. I even interned my senior year of high school in the state legislature as a research legislative intern. Went to college, um, was an economics major, was all headed for law school or an MBA perhaps. I even had the Foreign Service Officers exam on my desk for over a year, wondering and thinking. I mean, like any 20-year-old young person, you're trying to imagine what the world could be like and what your life might be like, and you've got all sorts of options. Okay? When I was a junior, I went overseas to Denmark for half a year. When I came back, I was supposed to intern at the federal courts here in the Twin Cities, and that job fell through. So I wasn't sure what to do with that summer, and I had a friend who needed a ride to a training event, and I said, sure, I'll take you, and that was up to northern Minnesota, and, um, or northern parts of the Twin Cities anyway. And as I got there, I realized, and as we were talking on the way, that this was a training event for Lutheran Youth Encounter. I knew a little bit about that organization. I knew like half the people that were there from, from church and from college and from just being in the church for a long time. And what they were training for was to be out in teams that summer, to go travel around the Midwest to small churches and big churches, to do family night programs, vacation Bible school, youth groups, all sorts of stuff. Ben Gieske, a member of our congregation, did that for a year this past year, and you've, you've interacted with him before. Well, they asked me while I was there. I was just dropping this guy off, and I was sticking around for the afternoon, and I kind of went into the evening because I knew most of the people, and they finally turned and looked and said, well, what are you doing this summer? And I said, well, nothing. And they said, well, would you like to do this for a summer? And I said, sure. And I called my folks up, and their only question is, are they going to pay anything? And um, they did pay me a little bit, so they were happy. So I went off for the summer, and partway through the summer, the leadership came to me and said, would you be interested in doing this for the whole year? We have a team that's going out to the East Coast this year, and they're short one person, and we think you'd be a good fit. And I said, sure. Now, I was the first person in my family to ever graduate from college, and now I'm a junior in college, not yet graduated. Turns out my dad was valedictorian of his high school class. There was no thought of him being able to go to college because they were too poor. Small town, Iowa, depression era child on the cusp of World War II. My mom, being of her generation, again, college wasn't even an option for her. My sisters had gotten married early, had not finished college. None of my cousins, my aunts, uncles, grandparents, nobody in all of my family had finished college. And there I was, just a few short months short of it, and I found myself in the church parking lot in Maple Grove, Minnesota, after a concert, sitting there with my dad, explaining to him that I wasn't going back to college for my senior year. The poor man, okay? With every fiber in his body, he wanted to tell me no, but because it was the church, he didn't know how to say no. And so he said yes. And God love him. I had no idea. Now sitting on this side of the fence with two guys about that age, I understand how impossible that was for him. So anyway, for a year, I traveled on the East Coast with a group of five, six other people. We did concerts and youth nights and youth events all around the East Coast. We traveled from the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, a lot of time in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York City, Long Island. Okay. Met all sorts of Lutherans, Finnish, Pennsylvania Dutch, urban New York. It was amazing. We stayed in 75 different towns that year. I stayed in 75 different homes. And I want to tell you about this one guy. I don't even remember his name anymore. He was career military. His wife had picked me up from the concert the night before at their church. And we had a nice conversation on the way home, but it was late. I went, I went down in their basement to their guest room, fell asleep. 
woke up in the morning to the most amazing smell of breakfast. It was glorious. But I had to kind of do an inventory of exactly where am I and who's in this house. And I went upstairs. She was gone. She was still working. Her husband was retired, and he was cooking me breakfast. And it was some, like, tomato and onion omelet. And it just smelled fabulous. And he was making German spätzle. okay? He was a German-American. He had been in World War II, tank commander, landed on D-Day, had four tanks shot out from under him. He survived all the way to the end of the war. Upon the end of the war, he turned into career military, worked at the Aberdeen Testing Grounds in Aberdeen, Maryland, tested tanks for the United States Army all of his career and trained tankers. Okay. Tough guy, little guy, stout guy, military haircut. I hadn't encountered many people like him before. He's cooking me breakfast. I'm in his house. We start talking. He serves me breakfast, interesting guy. Starts telling me his history. Gets done with that, he opens his Bible up and says, let's have devotion. Could have blown me over. Could have blown me over. And he started talking about how important his faith was and how it had sustained him through that whole trajectory of his life. And he was so proud of his congregation. And the capper was, after devotions, he took me to Aberdeen Testing Grounds and we got to play around with tanks for a while. Cool day. Okay. I met dozens of people like him that loved their congregation and who it mattered and sustained them that there were people that loved them and had told them about the love of God they found in Jesus Christ. My first call was to Walnut Grove, Minnesota. Um, they were very healthy, wonderful, loving congregation. They had had four, I was the fourth seminary grad in a row they had had as a pastor. They didn't need a pastor. They had a whole host of matriarchs and patriarchs that loved that place really well, took care of that congregation really well, and they were so good at it they could just take on somebody like me that had no clue what he was doing and teach him how to be a halfway decent pastor. Eventually I ended up in Illinois at a mission church. We're starting from scratch. We're in elementary school, junior high, high school, gymnasiums, auditoriums, cafeterias. Most of our congregation are lapsed something, lapsed Catholic, lapsed Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian. They had some roots, but they had given up on the church, bored, offended, ignored, something. And for whatever reason, some Sunday morning, they got up and thought they'd give the church one more try, and they wanted to go somewhere that looked least like a church. So they found us in this junior high cafetorium, cafe, cafeteria, Flash auditorium. No stained glass, no organ, no choir, no clerical collar, no robes, no stoles. As least threatening as you could be. The other part of our congregation was a sliver of Lutherans that were committed to people and mission and who decided to just give up their home churches who had launched them into this mission project and to go without all the things they were familiar with in order to give themselves away to reach out to people who hadn't found a church home yet. It was beautiful. There was a young couple there named Rob and Jody Bricado who, could not, who, who, who came to us early. She was a bank executive. I think he was in marketing. Wonderful young couple. Could not have a child physically. They had tried for a long time. They had tried in vitro. One night they called me up and had me come visit them. The in vitro hadn't worked. They were tapped out, they were strung out, they were tired, they were worn, they were discouraged. And they just called me up because they didn't know who else to call up. And they didn't want to talk to their family about it anymore. And they were starting to be really at odds with each other over the whole thing. It was an ordeal and a marathon that had kind of chewed them up. And they were wondering, should we try it again? Do we have the money to try it again? Should we think about adoption? Should we just give it up? Should we just end this marriage? I mean, they were all over the board, and they were discouraged. We had our conversation. We prayed together a little bit, and they began to talk to each other about what to do next. About that time, another young couple named Todd and Denise Manley showed up. Todd was really interesting to me. He was a production guy for the morning show on WGN Radio, kind of the CCO of Chicago, bigger. And you could always hear his voice in the morning on the morning shows. It was always kind of fun. And I, Todd had this interesting life, and he's a really committed young Christian guy, and it was just fun to hear him, how he was doing in his work and his world and his faith. His wife, Denise, was a history 
um, a master's degree person, and she worked in a museum in Chicago. They were urban and kind of hip and interesting couple. And they had a son named Grayson, maybe two or three years old at this time. And when they first showed up, their very first Sunday, they sat next to Rob and Jody Bricado, the couple that weren't able to have children. And Grayson migrated over towards them. And I actually remember that Sunday, and I remember Jody and Rob being really uncomfortable with this stranger's child. They didn't know what to do with it. They were just so bound up inside and so frustrated and so discouraged that to see anybody else's child was kind of unhappy for them. And Grayson persisted. And week after week, for whatever reason, this little guy just sought out Rob and Jody and eventually won them over. And Jody would bring books, and Rob would bring little toys, and Grayson would sit on their lap through the whole service. And you could just see them melt towards this little guy. Time goes on, and it's a long time. It's a year. It's several months later. I get a phone call, and it's Jody, and she's in tears, and she wants to tell me they're finally pregnant. They tried in vitro one last time, and it worked. And she was just with joy and finally able to tell people. A few months later, I get another phone call from Rob. He's at the hospital. They've had their child, and it's a little boy. And I said, I'll be right over. And I took my Andrew, who was little at the time. He loved going with me to these visits after school to the hospital to see the new babies. He thought it was cool that he could be the first one in the congregation to meet the new kid. So we walk in, and there's Rob, and there's Jody, and you can tell this is a great day, and there's this little baby boy. And I ask the name, and they kind of look at each other, and they look at me and they said, well, we decided to name him Grayson because that little boy saved us. So how does that happen? You know, it happens because of proximity. It happens because we belong together. It happens because we're community. Okay? And little voices can be our salvation can be the embodiment of Jesus just when we need him. So, I want to tell you just a few things real quickly here about why I really think congregations work and why I think they're important. The first thing is sometimes you fake it before you make it. Sometimes you live into an identity that you've assumed. Being part of the body of Christ lifts us up. And we live into being Jesus out in this world when we're surrounded by a vocabulary and the signs and symbols and images that teach us what that means. All the way from our children's ministry to our confirmation, we surround our children and young people. 250 kids in confirmation this year. Okay? We surround them with an identity that they live into and fill up in their own unique way. We become who we say we are sometimes. And being the body of Christ, people in mission with Jesus in this world, shape how we see this world and finally fundamentally shapes our identity, shapes how we behave in this world in a way that can't happen when we're alone. Okay. Secondly, um, God's love has to be embodied for it to be real. And here I'll just give you a little acronym, MRI, just like the medical technology, MRI, missional, relational, incarnational. It used to be that the church could be attractional, okay? Especially here in America, there was a day where you could just open your doors and people would find you to come see the show, and, and kind of the best show would win sometimes. Even Trinity had its heyday here, because it was the biggest, best, most polished Lutheran church when Lutheran was still a brand that mattered in Minnesota and in St. Croix Valley. For a long time, Luther, Trinity was just the best Lutheran show when Lutherans would move into town and seek out a Lutheran congregation. Well, that day's kind of over. There's a whole world out there that isn't interested in being attracted by the church. So we have to think of ourselves differently, and frankly, it's a return to who we were. First century ch churches weren't even churches. They met in houses. And it was like that way for generations. There wasn't a show. There wasn't an attraction. Instead, they were missional. They were out in the world embodying God's love for the world. They were relational. They were flesh on flesh, person to person. It wasn't a religious argument about propositions. It was a relationship and a community that offered them a new possibility in this world. 
It was a cruel, bitter, hard world in first century, second century, third century, fourth century, fifth century, sixth century, through the Dark Ages, through the Renaissance. Christians at their best were at their best because they had a community that was a radical alternative to the way the world was. It was more compassionate, more loving, more giving. It's a place where you could belong, whether you were poor, whatever class you belonged to, whatever ethnicity you were, and it's time for us to return to that authentic, real community. Missional, relational, incarnational. Finally, God has this mysterious plan that we become Jesus for this world. That the very Spirit of God that animated Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God, comes into our life and animates us out into this world, and we join Jesus out into mission in this world, and we do so by incarnation, incarnate, carnate, flesh, in flesh, we become God's presence, hands, feet, voice in the world. Missional, relational, and incarnational. We need to be the church that way. The third thing is that God's love needs a voice. Um, one of our young worship leaders, high school girl, Rachel, was supposed to be our worship leader today. I remember when she started. And she was a crop of, she was one of a few um, young men and women that we've asked to be worship leaders here. And for my experience, I love it when our 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 year old young men and young women lead us in liturgy. And when that young, pure voice lifts up phrase, I think maybe that's the way God sounds. It, it shapes my religious imagination. When we come and receive communion at Trinity, one of the things I love the best is that families often serve it together. Couples often serve it together. And I love the fact that I get to hear a husband and wife, a mom, a, a daughter, side by side saying, this is the body of Christ given for you. I have to believe that shapes that home and it shapes that relationship and it shapes me when I begin to imagine that God might sound like that. The person that prays next to you in worship, the person that sings from the choir, gives voice to God in a powerful way. Our confirmations are confirmation students are all put into small groups where they can hear the voice of God from someone else. Embodiment. Okay. The fourth thing is we are stronger in mission together than we are separately. There are more ideas, more creativity, more financial muscle. We move out into the world as a more significant force when we do it together than when we do it all by ourselves. One person alone can't change this world nearly as impactfully as we can together. One person can love this world, but we can love this world bigger together. We can love in this place, in this day, together more powerfully than we can alone. And we could have an abundant amount of examples of that from the life of Trinity today. And the last thing is that our prayer and praise is beautiful together. Our voices sound wonderful together. And if they don't to our ear, I think they do to God's ear. Do you ever have one of those moments where in your life you've caught a glimpse of beauty, a glimpse of grace, a, a glimpse of just perfection or harmony when things are just right? And you kind of stand there and you think, I'm just so lucky to be alive right now. <laughs> I'm just so happy about what I see. There was a time when, you know, I had two, Gretchen and I had two toehead blondes, okay? And one day in Chicago, I took them out to a park and they ran off, and they're two years apart. They're maybe like three and five, four and six, something like that. And they ran out onto this huge playground they had never seen before. And then descending kind of from every corner were these whole busloads of preschoolers from inner city Chicago. There wasn't a blonde hair in the group. Asian American, African American, and they came from everywhere and descended onto this playground just as my two toeheads get kind of swallowed up in this sea of dark hair, and I still remember that day. I remember standing on the hillside, I remember exactly what that day felt like, and watching my two beautiful boys get surrounded by this beautiful world. I think God feels that way about us when we get it right, and when we love each other really, really well, because it's a pure thing 
and a lovely thing. And it's the one force that can change this world. We make God happy when we love each other really well as community. And I'm going to leave you with one last image. Some of you who are gardeners know this better than I do. You know what a trellis is, right? The structure that you set up on a wall or independent from a wall to grow a vine with, right? We give it a structure for the vine to grow and to, to be something beautiful. But you can't ever confuse, the, you wouldn't confuse the trellis with the vine. Okay, the trellis is just the artifice, it's the device, it's the thing we, it's the prop that makes the whole thing work. The church sometimes gets the trellis and the vine confused, or they think the trellis is really important. The trellis is doctrine. The, the trellis are the things that we, we affirm about God. Now, they're important, and I suppose there are some trellises that are better than others. I believe there are some beliefs about God that are more life-giving and helpful than other things. But when we start arguing over the trellis, we lose the vine, and we're supposed to be the vine. We're supposed to be the living body of Christ that, that flourishes beyond the trellis, that grows in unimagined places, that follows Jesus out into this world, and that blossoms and gives life to this world. And we have to be more concerned about the vine than we are about the trellis. And at our worst, at our worst, congregations get it backwards. And they argue and fight about the trellis, and the vine withers and dies. And the world needs the vine. Not the trellis. Not in the same way. So, there's a lot that's right with congregations. I think that's why I have poured my life into this. So let us commit ourselves to loving each other well. Let us commit ourselves to loving the stranger even more than we love ourselves. Let us commit ourselves to give our way, in, or give ourselves away in mission as we follow Jesus out into this world. And in all of that, we will love God with all that we have and all that we are, and we will give God joy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, in his name.